بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد Brothers, elders, ulama karam sisters listening at home السلام عليكم ورحمة الله The brothers have asked me to speak on the life of one of the favorite children of Salahuddin of Bayt al-Maqdis, Salahuddin rahmatullah alayh. Muslims are meant to be people of reflection. And really, as an ummah today, we need to reflect. Why are we in the state that we're in? Is it a lack of numbers? And the answer to that is no. One in every five people walking on the face of this earth is a Muslim. Is it because of wealth and resources? And again, the answer is no. Many of the greatest natural resources are in the hands of the Muslims. So what's the reason? A billion in number? So much wealth? And why are we in the decadence that we find ourselves in today? The reason for this is that there is a lack of men and women of substance. Men and women, like Ismail was saying, who are mobilized. When Ali radiallahu anhu became the Khalif, and this was in a time of great turmoil, Uthman radiallahu anhu had just been martyred, he ascended the pulpit and his first inaugural speech, his first khutbah, was what? All he said was when he ascended the pulpit, he said, Oh people, you are in need of a rajulun fa'ala qawwal. Oh people, you are in need of a man of actions and not a man who just speaks. And then he descended from the pulpit. And really this was a miracle of the Prophet wasallam that he created men and women of substance. Because he never worked on structures. He wasn't concerned on big stru construct on structures. He worked on the hearts and the minds of individuals until he created men and women who changed the landscape of history. Men and women who were heavy in the scales of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Men and women like Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. Upon occasion, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu was climbing a tree. And he had very thin shins. And when the Sahaba, they saw his thin shins, they began to laugh. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam turned to the Sahaba and he said, What's making you laugh? And they said, O Messenger of Allah, the thin shins of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And the Prophet wasallam said, I swear by Allah, if the thin shins of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud were placed in one side of the scale, and the mountain of Uhud was placed in the other side of the scale, the thin shins of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud would be heavier than the mountain of Uhud. Why? Because see, every muscle, Every drop of blood which ran through the thin shins was for the sake of Allah. They weren't a large mass, but they were of quality. And this is a sunnah of Allah. Allah never judges a group of people by their numbers. He judges them by their quality, their substance. The greatest men of this ummah were who? It was the 313 who participated in the battle of Badr. Upon occasion, Jibra'il alayhi salatu salam descended to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, who are the best from your ummah? And he said, Alladheena shahidu Badran. Those who participated in the battle of Badr. And Jibra'il alayhi salatu salam said, Similarly, out of all those angels in the heavens, all those angels in the heavens, the most honorable and the best are those angels who descended on the day of Badr and assisted the Muslims. These were 313 men, but they were men of substance. They trusted in Allah. They stood against an army of a thousand who was armed to their teeth. They hardly had any horses. 
hardly had any weapons, but they trusted in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until they reached a state which was unparalleled in the history of Islam. In the time of the Prophet sallallahu there was a sahabi called Hatib ibn Abi Balta. And Hatib was a Badri sahabi. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam decided to attack Makkah, he informed the Sahaba. And what Hatib did, and Hatib was a man who had migrated, but he wasn't a Qurayshi. He wrote a letter to the people of Makkah informing them of the plans of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Ali Miqdad and Zubair radiallahu anhum and he said, go to the garden of Khakh, and there you will find a lady on a camel, and with her she will have a letter, and bring that letter back. And they went to the garden of Khakh, and exactly where the Prophet ﷺ said, they found a lady on a camel. And they said, give us the letter. And she said, I have no letter. I have no letter. But these people trusted in the words of the Prophet ﷺ. They knew the Prophet ﷺ said something, it was the truth. They said, give us the letter, otherwise we'll strip you. And from the plaits of her hair, she brought a letter forth, which was from Hatib informing the people of Makkah about the plans of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ summoned Hatib. And he said, what's this Hatib? And Hatib said, O Messenger of Allah, do not hasten to pass judgment over me, because I am not a man who likes disbelief or I am displeased with Islam. But the reason I did this is that every other migrant muhajir has family in Makkah who can help their direct family. I have no family. And the only reason I did this was so the people of Makkah wouldn't harm my family. And the Prophet wasallam turned to Hatib and he said, Indeed, you have spoken the truth. And Umar was standing there. Umar was Umar. And Umar said, O Messenger of Allah, let me strike at the neck of this manafiq. And the Prophet said, O Umar, didn't Hatib participate in the battle of Badr? And Umar said, Yes, he did. He said, Maybe Allah looks favorably upon the people of Badr. And he says, O oh, people of Badr, do as you wish, because Jannah has become wajib upon you. Why? Because see, these people trusted in Allah. Numbers never scared them. And today I want to speak about a person, you know, by Allah, numbers never scared him. Europe threw everything that they had at him, but they couldn't scare him. Like the people of Badr fulfilled the rights of jihad, Salahuddin fulfilled the rights of jihad. Like the people of Badr fulfilled the rights of this ummah, Salahuddin fulfilled the rights of this ummah. Like the people of Badr were ready to sacrifice everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salahuddin was ready to sacrifice everything for the sake of Allah. Like Allah gave victory to the people of Badr, similarly Allah gave victory to Salahuddin rahmatullah alayhim. It was almost as though Allah kept Salahuddin back from the people of Badr so he could deal with his enemies at a different place and a different time. And the testimony to the greatness of this man is that every single person claimed him. Even his arch enemies claimed him. When the news of his bravery and compassion reached Europe, they couldn't believe that a non-white, non-Christian man could be so brave and so compassionate. So myths began to circulate in Europe that actually Salahuddin was the son of a white Christian princess who was taken into captivity and then she was married off to a man called Malakin and from that marriage came forth a man called Salahuddin. And on the other hand, many Arabs refused to believe that a non-Arab could be of such great stature and they and they traced his lineage back to the tribe of Adnan, as though only Arabs have ever been achieved, able to achieve great things. Islamic history is a testimony to the fact that whenever Muslims were in danger, many of those people who came to the forefront were non-Arabs. Bayt al-Maqdis is in the heart of the Middle East, surrounded by Arabs. But who were the men who raced to liberate it in the Middle Ages? It was men like Maudud, 
Imaduddin, Nuruddin, they were all Turks. They were all Turks. Yusuf Tashfin was a Berber, Nizamuddin Mulk was a Persian, and Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhim ajma'in, he was a Kurd. He was a Kurd. Because they felt that it was their duty, that they had to liberate the land because they felt that they were an Ummah. And Salahuddin was born in the fort of Tikrit. And his mother mentioned that when I was pregnant with Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayh, I saw a dream that in my stomach, I have a sword from the swords of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And the amazing thing is that the day Salahuddin Rahmatullah was born was the day that his father was expelled from the fort of Tikrit. His father ran the fort of Tikrit and his uncle Shirku killed one of the guards because he dishonored a lady. And because the governor of Baghdad disliked his father, he had them expelled. And the narrations mentioned this was the day that Salahuddin Rahmatullah was born. And they mentioned that on the journey, his father thought that Salahuddin was a source of misfortune. And every time he would cry, he would break out in a fit of rage. He wanted to kill him. Until one of the servants said, he said, Oh my master, do you think misfortune came because of this child? Look at him. He cannot assist, no can he harm. This is the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How amazing are these words? Because for Salahuddin rahmatullah alayhi to attain what he was destined to attain, he had to leave Tikrit and go to Mosul. Because see, great men create other great men. The greatest of this ummah were the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And the Sahaba sat at the feet of the greatest of creation sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he did their tarbiyah and the place that they were destined to was Mosul. Mosul was run by Imaduddin Zinki. Imaduddin Zinki. And Najmuddin, the father of Salahuddin, had assisted Imaduddin when he was being chased by an army. He took him into the fort and then he kept him there and then he provided a safe passage for him. And therefore, Imaduddin never forgot this. And when Salahuddin's father reached there, Imaduddin took them in with open arms. And he hosted them. And he also realized the great men that he had received. Because Shirku and Najmuddin were military men. They were warriors. And this was the environment in which Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi was brought up in. It was a military environment. There was never a day when the expulsion of the crusaders was not mentioned. But it was not only a military environment. It was not a dry military environment. It was a very religious, spiritual environment. Because Imaduddin, listen to this, Imaduddin and Nuruddin were the founders of the Madrasa system. They found the Madrasa system. It was the Madrasa system which created men like Salahuddin. If there was no Imaduddin, no Nuruddin, there would have been no Salahuddin. And Salahuddin, from a very early age, he became a hafid of the Qur'an, he was a Shafi in fiqh, and he memorized Kitab al-Tanbih of the Shafi school of fiqh. You ask me, how many Hanafi ulama are sitting in the gathering? How many Hanafi ulama in Birmingham? How many of them know one matan of a Hanafi text? Salahuddin memorized it all. And his greatest aspiration in life was to become a scholar. He loved the scholars. Throughout his life, the men that he respected the most were the ulama. And when Imaduddin passed away, Salahuddin was still young. Then he had the honor of being tutored by a man regarding who Ibn Athir rahmatullah alayhi says, says, I have studied the lives of the Khulafa and I've studied the lives of all the kings. And since the Khulafa Rashidun and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, the Muslims never had a man who was as upright and caring and compassion as Nuruddin Zinki rahmatullah alayhi. Meaning, for 450 years, the Muslims never had a man like Nuruddin Zinki rahmatullah alayhi. And Salahuddin would say that Nuruddin is my master. He modeled himself on Nuruddin. And as I said, if there was no Nuruddin, there would have been no Salahuddin. As a poet says, he said, Kam tarak al awwal lil akhir. He said, How often somebody else sows the seeds and he does all the root work, and those who come later, they reap the fruits of it. And also, Nuruddin 
realize the potential in Salahuddin. And this is why, when in Damascus, crime became rife, he made Salahuddin at a very tender age, in charge of the entire police of Damascus. And as a poet says, he says, and then Salahuddin worked on the people and he brought peace back to Damascus. And the poet says, he says, he's speaking to the thieves of Sham. He says, رَوَيْدُكُمْ يَا لَصُوصُ الشَّام فَإِنِّي لَكُمْ نَاصِحٌ فِي مَقَالِي إِيَّاكُمْ مِنْ سَمِّ النَّبِي يُوسُفَ رَبِّ الْحِجَا وَالْجُمَالِ فَذَاقَ مُقْتُعِيدِ النَّسَا وَحَاذَ مُقْتُعِيدِ الرِّجَال He says, O oh, thieves of Sham, hold on, take it easy. My words of deep admonishment for you. Beware of the one who has the same name as the Prophet Yusuf. Because Salahuddin's name was also Yusuf. The Yusuf, the Prophet, who had insight and who was beautiful. But the difference between the two is that the Prophet used to cut the hands of the ladies. And what this means is when the rumor spread that Zulaikha, the honorable woman, fell in love with the slave, the other honorable women began to say, what kind of woman is she? She fell in love with the slave. So what Zulaikha did is she gathered all these women and she gave them a fruit and a knife and she told them cut the fruit. And then she said, told Yusuf والسلام, to walk past. And Yusuf والسلام, was walking past and they were cutting the fruit. And when they saw the beauty of Yusuf والسلام, they became so immersed in the beauty of Yusuf والسلام, that they cut through the fruit and they began to cut their fingers and they did not even realize. And this is what the poet says, For that use of the Prophet, he cuts the hands of the women. As for this Yusuf, he cuts the hands of the robbers. And after a while, when Salahuddin grew up somewhat, Salahuddin meant the crusaders attacked Egypt. And what a deed the Khalif in Egypt did is that he cut the hair of his wife and he sent it to Nuruddin. And this meant that we can no longer look after our women, assist us. And Nuruddin rahmatullah didn't want to assist them because see, the Al-Adid and the Egyptians were Fatimites. The Fatimites were Shias. And they were not only Shia, they were a very decadent nation. When the crusaders took Marat al-Numan, they killed a hundred thousand Muslims. The Tafos actually cannibalized young children. The vast majority of people who were killed out of the hundred thousand were deprived of water. They died thirsty. And what did the Fatimites do? They actually sent a delegation to the crusaders to actually congratulate them. Because the people that they had killed were Sunnis. They congratulated them. So Nuruddin didn't want to go, didn't want to send an army. But Shirku, the uncle of Salahuddin, convinced him. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi says, say, when my uncle came to me to take me to Egypt, I didn't want to go. One, because his aspirations was to become a scholar. But second, he mentions, you know, I thought I was going to die. As Allah says, you know, in the Quran, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ you know, it is a possibility that you will dislike something. But it is, there is good in it for you. And by Allah, Salahuddin going, there was good for the Ummah. There was good for history. He changed the landscape of history. And Shirku rid Egypt of the Crusaders. And shortly after this, Adid remained the Khalif. But Shirku became second in charge. After a while, Shirku passed away. And the ulama and the fuqaha, they chose Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi as, as in the place of Shirku. And therefore Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi became the second most powerful man in Egypt. He was only 32 at the time. And Salahuddin showed what a real leader should be. He removed all the taxes which were contrary to the sh Sharia. He established Sunni madrasas everywhere. There were only Shia madrasas. He established Sunni madrasas. By the time al adid was passing away, Salahuddin made an announcement that after tomorrow, from now, Egypt will be Sunni. The historians mention no two rams locked horns. No two rams locked horns. Meaning nobody disagreed because see the people loved Salahuddin. 
He won their heart. He was a true leader. He showed love and compassion to people. And that love and compassion was reciprocated. There was no leader who was loved as much as the Prophet ﷺ. But then there was no leader who showed his subjects as much love as the Prophet ﷺ did. The historian, the, the ulama mentioned the hadith where they mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ the description of the Prophet Sallallahu they say, كَانَ أَجْوَدَ nas. He was the most generous of people. And Ibn Murrah mentioned, he said, I swear by Allah, if Salahuddin had been given the entire dunya to spend in the path of Allah, it would have not been enough for him. His treasurers would never tell him how much they had in the treasury because he would spend it all. In times of affluence and difficulty, he would spend the same. It is recorded by Jabir anhu that the Prophet ﷺ never said no to somebody who asked him for something. And the historians mention that Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi never in his life did he turn away a beggar. They mention that never in his life, listen to this, never in his life did he ride a horse, but he had already promised to give it to somebody else. And Ibn Shaddad, Ibn Shaddad was the closest man to Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi. He was the biographer of Salahuddin. The day Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi passed away was the day that he finished the biography of Salahuddin. He mentioned that one day I was traveling with Salahuddin and Salahuddin turned to me and he said, Oh Ibn Shaddad, there are people in the dunya to whom dust and wealth is the same. And Ibn Shaddad said, I knew that he was speaking about himself because he didn't care about the dunya. The palace that Adid left behind him, well, there was nothing like it in the world. It had 4,000 rooms, 12,000 occupants. And besides his direct family, all the occupants were women. And Salahuddin refused to move in it. He divided it amongst his men, he refused to move in it. And therefore Salahuddin wasn't just a warrior. It is the barakah of Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi that today Egypt is Sunni. Egypt had been Shia for over 280 years. Al Azhar, the oldest Muslim university, had been Shia for over 200 years. And it was Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi who brought it back into Sunniism. He brought it back into Sunniism. Salahuddin was in Egypt and Nuruddin Rahmatullah alayhi was in Syria. Now after Nuruddin passed away, Syria just fragmented. All the princes were only interested in their little fiefdom. And they began to side with the crusaders to fight other princes. And many of them were giving annual tributes. They were actually giving annual tributes to the crusaders. And the people of Syria were disgusted because they were used to a man like Nuruddin, a powerful, charismatic man. Historians mention when Nuruddin would become ill, the entirety of Syria would become ill. As a poet says, he said, Marid al Habib, Fa'utuhu, Famaridhu min Husni alay, Fashufi al Habib, Fa'adani, Fashufitu min Nadri ilay. He says, My Habib became ill, and I went to visit him, and seeing him in an ill state, I became ill as well. And then Allah gave my Habib Shifa, he became better. And when my Habib became better, when I saw him, he came to visit me. And when I saw him that he was in a better state, I became better as well. The historians mention that when Nuruddin would become ill, the entirety of Syria would become ill. And when Nuruddin would be become better, the entirety of Syria would become better. And the people of Syria, they turned to Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi. And this was the time that Salahuddin started on his expeditions. Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi spent longer, understand this, he spent longer fighting Muslims than he did non-Muslim. He fought with Muslims for over 10 years because he understood that if you are divided, you are weak. You are weak nationally, globally, in a community if you are divided and you are susceptible to invasion. But if you are united, you are strong. And he understood this. And for over 10 years, he fought with other Muslims to unite them. And the historians mention that Salahuddin would say, if it was not for the 
if it was not for the sake that I want to drive out the crusaders, I wouldn't care how many Muslim rulers they were. But Ibn Shaddad mentions that since Salahuddin had made this intention to remove the crusaders from the holy land, he said, if a person took an oath, took an qasim, that he spent every single penny in the, in the way of jihad, he would not be wrong. He said the only thing Salahuddin spoke about was jihad. If anybody wanted to get close to Salahuddin, they would speak about jihad. Men wrote entire books on the topic of jihad for Salahuddin rahmatullah alayhi. Entire books. And the other Muslim rulers said to Salahuddin, they said, Oh Salahuddin, we will give you money, go back. And Salahuddin said, how can I unite with you people? How can I negotiate with you people when you are in one valley and I am in another valley? The valley that he attributed to them was the value of this dunya, the value of preserving their kingdoms. While the value that he attributed to himself was the value which led to the akhirah, the value of preserving this ummah. And this is why Shaykh Abul Hassan Nadwi rahmatullah alayhi, he said he defined once, defining Salahuddin, he says, Kana mu'minan musliman muhammadiyan la ya'rifu ghayra lughatil Qur'an. He said Salahuddin was a Muslim, he was a muhammadi, he was a mu'min. The only language that he understood was the language of the Qur'an. The only language that he understood was the language of Islam and Iman. And today you have many Kurds who dislike Salahuddin. They dislike Salahuddin because they believe that he did nothing for their nation. But by Allah, if Salahuddin was here today, he couldn't understand their language because he didn't understand the language of nationalism. He didn't understand the language of Qawmiya. And this is my tribe and this is my country. He understood one language and that was the language of Iman and Islam. And the amazing thing was that the Muslim leaders united with the crusaders to fight Salahuddin rahmatullah alayhi. Many of them sided with the crusaders and they released a man who was the greatest arch enemy of Islam, a man called Reginald de Chatillon. For 15 years, this man had been in prison. Nuruddin had left him in the dungeons of Halab. They released him so he would be a thorn in the side of Salahuddin. And what did this man do? Soon as he mustered up an army, he marched on Makkah. And na'udhu billah, he was saying, when I reach Makkah, I will bring the Kaaba to the ground. And then na'udhu billah, he said, I will go to Medina. And na'udhu billah, I will take the camel herder from his grave, speaking about the Prophet wasallam, And I will bring him back to my palace in Kerok. And I will charge the Muslims to view his body. And the narrations mention that when Salahuddin heard this, he took out his sword, he lifted it to the skies, and he said, by Allah, I will kill Reginald with my own hands. Because he had a deep love for the Prophet ﷺ. The historians mention that Salahuddin never listened to a hadith standing up. When the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ would be recited, he would sit down and he would make everybody else sit down. This is the love that he had for the Prophet ﷺ. And he dispatched an army under Husamuddin Lutlu. And Husamuddin Lutlu went to his mother to visit her before he left. And he told her, he said, Oh, my mother, Reginald has done this and he's saying this. And all of a sudden she shouted, Allahu Akbar. And he said, What's wrong, my mother? And he said, You know, let me tell you something. You know, when you were a child, you reached the age of three and you couldn't speak. And this was of deep concern to me. And in ruku, in sajda, I would make dua for you. And one night I went to sleep with this on my mind. And in a dream, I saw that there was this man who had a noor on his face and he was carrying you and he was kissing you on the forehead. And he was saying to me, he's saying, your son will be a liberator and a protector of the Haramain Sharifain. And he said, this is why since you joined the army of Salahuddin, Rahmatullah alayhi, I always ask you, where are you fighting? And you would tell me sometimes in Jordan, sometimes in Egypt, sometimes in Syria. Now that has come to pass. Now it has come to pass. And Osama Din took a navy, he annihilated the army of Reginald, and then he captured his men, he took them to Medina, and he executed them in Medina. 
And four years after this, again, when the Muslims and the Christians had a truce, Reginald attacked a Muslim caravan traveling from Egypt to Syria. And what he would do every time he would put a Muslim to the sword, he would say, you believe in Muhammad wasallam. Now ask him to help you. And then he would strike his neck. And when Salahuddin heard this, he again took an oath that he would kill this man with his own hands. And it was upon this occasion that Salahuddin brought forth an army. And this is the famous battle, the battle of Hittin. And the crusaders brought forth an army. And when Salahuddin consulted his men, he said, what shall we do? Shall we carry on attacking their forts and their castles? Or shall we have a head on confrontation? And they said, carry on attacking their forts. And Salahuddin said, no. He said, we will take him head on. Because none of us knows how long he's going to live. And matters run by what Allah decrees, not what we desire. And each one of us should expend himself. And then he said, oh my men, fight to please your Lord. Do not fight to please me. And they marched on to the army of the crusaders. The crusader army was considerably larger than the Muslim army. When they reached there, the crusader army was deeply entrenched. And they had barricaded themselves. So Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi didn't rush. He showed what a military genius he was. What he did, he went to a nearby fort. And, he, and this fort had the women and the children of the soldiers there. And he lay siege to it. And then he put his back against the sea. Now, the Christian charges were very strong. The Muslims had problems dealing with Christian charges. But tactically, the Muslims were far superior. So what the Christians thought was one charge and Salahuddin will end up in the sea. And this is exactly what Salahuddin wanted them to think. So next morning, they marched. Midsummer, it was midsummer, with them they had the true cross. The true cross was the most sacred relic in Christendom. It was believed that a part of this cross, upon it, Isa والسلام, was crucified. So they believed this, and obviously crucifixion is central to Christianity. He died for their sins on this cross. And they believed that as long as they have this, they could never lose a battle. They actually believed that they had won the previous 20 battles because of the barakah of this cross. So they marched, it was midsummer. And what Salahuddin Rahmatullah then he had put strategically, he had put archers on the way. Midsummer, and what he did, he poisoned all the wells. So when they began to march, these archers began to shower arrows. So many arrows, so many arrows, that their movements became snail pace. The march should have taken them eight hours. But by sunset, they were miles away from their destination, and thousands of them had perished. And they thought night would bring them relief. But the historians mentioned that Salahuddin Rahmatullah's men had encircled them in a manner that not even an ant could go through. And they mentioned there they were two different cries from two different camps. Because all night the arrows carried on coming. So from the Muslim camp, there were the cries of Takbir Allah Akbar. And from the Christian camp, there were the cries of the dying and the wounded. And overnight, Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi bought 400 camels laden with arrows, another 70 waiting. Water was plentiful. The Christians had no water. And next morning, Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi noticed that the brushwood was dry and the wind was blowing in the direction of the crusaders. So it's midsummer, no water, and they lit the brushwood. And then now they began to choke on the smoke as well. And it was here that the Muslims attacked. And they were reciting the verse, وَكَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And indeed, it is a right upon us that we assist the believers. They were reciting these verses. And then Salahuddin wanted to afflict the final psychological blow. And that was to capture the true cross. It was believed as long as they have this cross, they can never lose a battle. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah sent the entire regiment to capture it. And when the regiment captured it, this totally demoralized the Christians and they fell by the wayside. And only 150 of them remained standing. 
around the king, 150 nights, and the Muslims attacked. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah was watching this, and his brother was standing next to him. And he said, Alhamdulillah, we have defeated them. And Salahuddin said, not yet. And then he attacked again. And the Christians went back. And the, his brother said, not, he said, Alhamdulillah, we have defeated them. And Salahuddin said, wait, not yet. When that tent falls, the tent of the king, then we have defeated them. And when Salahuddin Rahmatullah was saying this, the tent fell. And what did Salahuddin do? What did he do? Did he jump up and down? He descended from his mount and he went into sajda. Because he understood that victory and defeat is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the greatest preparation for victory on the battlefield is off the battlefield. When Umar ibn Khattab sent Saad ibn Abi Waqas to fight the superpower of the day, the Persians, what advice did he give him? Was it military advice? He said, O oh Saad, I advise you and your men that to inculcate taqwa, because taqwa is your greatest weapon. And fear your sins more than you fear your enemies. Because wars and battles are lost on the basis of people's sins. And Salahuddin wasn't just a warrior. Ibn Shaddad mentions, and he accompanied Salahuddin for years. He says, Salahuddin for years never missed Salah with Jamaat. He didn't live next to the Jami Masjid. He didn't live in a palace. He lived on a tent in the battlefield. For years he never missed Salah with Jamaat. And one day before the battle, the, one night before the battle, he was inspecting his men. And tahajjud time, they were sleeping. And the definition of the Sahaba was what? They were men who would pray at night and be on their horsebacks during the day. And at tahajjud time, these people were sleeping. And Salahuddin said, wake up, wake up. For you people will make us lose the battle. Because he wanted his men to be like the Sahaba. And we can't wake up for Fajr. And we talk about victory. We can't, when we see the suffering of our Muslim brothers and sisters, we can't put our hands in our pockets. And we can't even give our zakat. And we're talking about victory. When it's Hajj time, we're not ready yet. But we want Allah to be ready to assist us. Since when did you become Allah and Allah become your servant? It is the servants who have to fulfill the conditions. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayhi would do anything to attain the help of Allah. Ibn Shaddad mentions that upon occasion we were in the battlefield and I said to, I said to Salahuddin, I said, Salahuddin, it has been mentioned that the hadith has been recited on every occasion. But it's never been mentioned that the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu has been recited in the battlefield. And Salahuddin said, call the muhaddithin. And they called the muhaddithin and in midst the battle, they began to recite the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Why did he do this? Because he believed that maybe due to the barakah of the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Allah's nusra and Allah's help would descend. This was the kind of man Salahuddin was. He wasn't just a warrior. He was a man of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after the, after the battle, this was such a complete victory that Imad mentions that when you looked at those who were dead, it was um, impossible to believe that anybody could have lived. And when you looked at those Christian crusaders who were alive, there were so many of them, one could not believe that any one of them was dead. And, this, and they were so demoralized that historians mention that one Muslim would have a rope with 30 crusaders on that one rope. And he would be pulling them and none of them had the will to fight. And there was a faqih who was amongst this army and he sold one of the captives for a pair of sandals. And somebody asked him, what did you do that for? He said, because I wanted history to remember how many the crusaders were and how cheap they were. And Imam Dhahabi says something profound here. He says, this was the greatest victory for the Muslims. Since in Sham, since Khalid bin Walid defeated the Romans at the battle of Yarmouk. That is a profound statement. And Salahuddin didn't ease up here. 
Salahuddin Rahmatullah they didn't ease up here. Two days later, he was in Acre, north. Then they took Turan, Haifa, Arsuf, Beirut, Nablus, and a number of other places. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah the reason he took all the ports was so the crusaders could not get any more reinforcements in. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah marched on his greatest aim in life, and that was the liberation of the holy places. And they mentioned that Salahuddin Rahmatullah would very rarely laugh, smile. And somebody asked him, you know, you're the king of Egypt, Syria, Yemen, Lebanon. You very rarely smile. He had everything. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah said, how can I smile? How can I smile? How can food and water taste good to me when Bayt al-Maqdis is in the hands of the crusaders? I wonder what Salahuddin would say if he was here today. I wonder what he would say about the Muslims and their apathy towards the holy lands today. And the astrologers had told Salahuddin, they said, oh Salahuddin, we have seen in the stars that if you try to take Jerusalem, you will lose an eye. And Salahuddin said, you're talking about me losing an eye? I swear by Allah, I will take the holy lands, even if it means I walk into Jerusalem blind. Even if I walk in blind. And for five days, Salahuddin went around Jerusalem until on the 20th of Rajab, they found an ideal place to lay siege. And for six days, they pounded the city. And on the 26th, Balian came out to ask for terms. And Salahuddin said, no. Salahuddin said, I offered you terms initially, you didn't take them. Now the city is mine. And then Balian said, if you do not offer us terms, then we will kill the 5,000 Muslims in the city and we will destroy the masjid. And really, this is a testimony to the greatness of Salahuddin Rahmatullah He could have easily said, do it, do it. And when we take it, you will see what we do to your men, women and children. But this was, this was a testimony to Salahuddin because he, had, he knew that these Muslims had been at the front line for 88 years. Their suffering, they had suffered for 88 years. And he didn't want them to go through any more suffering. He realized this. And similarly today, the Muslims who are in Palestine, they are fulfilling the fard kifaya on behalf of this ummah. No exaggeration. For how many years? How many years have the Muslims been in Palestine? For over 60 years, they've been persecuted. They are fulfilling a fard kifaya on behalf of this ummah. If it was anybody else, they would have cut and run. But see, they still have sayings like, they look the Jewish, the, the Israeli army in the eyes, and they have these sayings like, نَحْنُ أَبْنَاءُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَكُلُّنَا صَلَاحُ الدِّينَ So we are the children of the Muslims, and every single one of us is the Salahu Deen. They are fulfilling, Wallahi, they are fulfilling the Fardh Kifaya on behalf of this Ummah. And it's a disgrace by Allah. It's a disgrace that they have to wait for handouts from the EU, from America. I mean, what do you expect from these people? They're all banging on about democracy. And when the people of Palestine chose Hamas by a landslide, then what does it mean? Yes, democracy, but you must democratically choose those who we tell you to choose. And then what did they do? They, they tried to starve these people, the EU and America. It didn't work. Then the blockade started. It didn't work. And then they wanted to bomb them into an abyss. And you expect anything more from these people? You must understand the mentality that you're dealing with. No, seriously. You know, these people who, are the, who follow the Jahiliya me methodology, where unsur akhaka zaliman or mudluman, before Islam, the Arabs used to have this saying, assist your brother, may he be the oppressor or the oppressed. And what this meant, anybody who has allegiance with you is your brother, you assist him. And upon occasion, the Prophet wasallam said, Unsur akhaka zaliman or mudluman, assist your brother, may he be the oppressor and the, or the oppressed. And the Sahaba knew that this contravened the essence of Islam. And they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we can understand assisting the oppressed, but how do we assist the oppressor? And the Prophet ﷺ said, stop him from his oppression. 
And these people believe in it. They believe in that Jahiliya methodology. They will assist Israel. You know, a group of people who have taken other people's land and put them in a concentration camp. This, what was the sin of the Palestinians? What was their sin? They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, a crime perpetrated by the white Europeans upon the Jews for which the olive skin Arabs had to pick up the bill. You know, justice says if land was given, then it should have been from Germany. And if the British were so keen on creating a state, then they should have given them Wales. And if the Americans are so interested in supporting them, then why don't they give them one of their states? And this is what you call justice. And you must understand the mentality that you're dealing with seriously. This is a mentality which wiped out 300 million red Indians. Red Indians in America, like Ismail was saying. And then they still had the goal to depict the cowboy as the good guy and the Indians as the savages. These are the people who went to Australia and wiped out the Aborigines, New Zealand, the Maoris. They were the savages and these were the good guys. So you must understand the mentality that you're dealing with. They have the Jailia principles. But the shame is upon us. By Allah, for those Palestinians who have died, this is their victory. By Allah, this is their victory. Because sometimes in loss for individuals, it's the victory, but it's a slap in our face. Hamza radiallahu anhu passed away on the battle of Uhud. He passed away, his body was mutilated. His parts, they made necklaces out of him. But it was on the occasion of Uhud that he was given the title of Asadullah, the line of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And really, this is a shame. You know, recently they had a documentary where they had that blind man. Four children, four sons in prison. He's blind. And the Israelis put a blank check in front of him. They said, fill it in, sign it. You know, how, whatever you want and give us your land. What did he say? He said, if you want the land, then you will have to take the signature of every single Muslim on the face of this earth. Because this land belongs to every single Muslim. And this is not just an issue of land. This is an issue of Aqeedah. You know, this is an issue of Aqeedah. Why don't we feel for the Palestinians like we felt for the Indians in Gujarat when the genocide took place? Why don't we feel for the Palestinians like we felt for the Pakistanis when the earthquake took place? Why don't the Bengalis feel for the Palestinians like when the floods take Why? The reason is because see, knowingly or unknowingly, many of us give preference to our nationality over our Islamic identity. Knowingly or unknowingly. And that is the reality of it. And these people are fulfilling a fard kifaya on behalf of this ummah. And Salahuddin gave valiant terms. And Salahuddin rahmatullah alayhi entered when? He entered, he entered Jerusalem on the very night very day that the Prophet وسلم, entered Jerusalem where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records in the Quran Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al harami ila al masjid al aqsa Pure is he who took his servant from Makkah to Jerusalem This was on the 27th of Rajab Salahuddin rahmatullah alayhi entered Jerusalem on the 27th of Rajab and can you imagine how the Muslim must have felt when they entered? Can you imagine 88 years of persecution? Can you imagine when they saw the fortifying walls of Jerusalem? They must have remembered the stories of how living Muslims were catapulted over the walls of Jerusalem 88 years. When they saw the Christian women, they must have remembered how every single Muslim woman was violated 88 years ago. Well, when they entered and they saw the Christian children, they must have remembered the stories of how babies were snatched from their mother's breast and their heads were smashed against the walls. When they entered the masjid, they must have remembered the stories 
of how 70,000 Muslims were killed in the masjid in one day until their blood was running up to the knees of those who were doing the butchering. All these memories must have come back to the Muslims. But Salahuddin Rahmatullah had a greater memory in the back of his mind, which overrid all these memories. And that was when the Prophet ﷺ re-entered Makkah. After 13 years of persecution, the Muslims migrated to Medina. And then after 10 days, they were walking into Makkah. And today, they were the conquerors. There was no Amnity International. There was no Red Cross on one instruction. Thousands of heads could have been removed from their body. And can you imagine how the Muslim must have felt when they entered back into Makkah? They must have seen the place where Bilal was dragged until his skin would peel from his body. They must have seen that place where Huba would be made to lie until the flesh on his back would melt. They must have seen that place where two young girls, Lubaina and Unaysa, were killed for what? Because they believed in La ilaha illallah. They must have seen the place where Ammar, Yasir, Sumayya, the entire family would be persecuted. And the Prophet ﷺ would often walk past and he would rub his hand over the head of Ammar and he would say, Sabran ya ala Yasir fa inna mawidakumul jannah. He would say, oh family of Yasir, have sabr because your abode by Allah is Jannah. They must have seen all these places. And in the heat of the moment, a sahabi shouted out, al yawmu yawmul malhama. Today is the day of bloodshed. Today is the day of retribution. Today is payback time. And the Prophet ﷺ heard this and he said, oh Saad, come here. Change that cry into Al Yomu Yomul Marhama. Today is the day of mercy. Today is the day of forgiveness. And similarly, Stanley Lane Poole mentioned in his classic, he mentions that the Muslim king showed the Christians the meaning of compassion. He showed them the meaning of compassion. Salahuddin in this early battle only killed one man and 200 Templars. And that man was the, after the battle of Hittin. Who was it? Reginald de Chatillon. After the battle, they erected a tent for Salahuddin. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi, the king was brought to Salahuddin. And Salahuddin gave him some water to drink because he was lapping. And then he drank the water and he gave it to Reginald. And Salahuddin became angry. He said, you gave it to him. I didn't give it to him. Because if you gave somebody water, this was an indication you've given him protection in the Arab world. Like you throw a shoe at somebody, it's an indication, you know, you're humiliated amongst us. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah walked up to Reginald and he reminded him of his transgressions. And he reminded him of what he said about the Prophet ﷺ. And Reginald said that this is what kings have always been doing. And Salahuddin offered him Islam. And he refused. And then Salahuddin said, do you know who I am? He said, I am the representative of the Prophet ﷺ. And I, on this world, take revenge on behalf of the Prophet ﷺ. And then he fulfilled his promise. And then he put 200 other knights to the sword, who were the knight templars and hospitalers. And these men, knights, had taken an oath that they would wipe, out, wipe this earth clean of the infidel Muslims. And Salahuddin said that he would cleanse the earth from them. And he killed 200, put 200 knights to the sword. And Stanley Lane Poole mentioned that when Salahuddin came into Jerusalem, he showed the Christians the meaning of compassion. The Muslim king showed the Christians the meaning of compassion. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah alayhi he entered the masjid. You know, can you imagine after 88 years, the Muslims are now entering the masjid. After 88 years, they are coming back into the third holiest place. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make that day that we also enter it without, without it being besieged by the Zionists. May Allah make us amongst those who do the liberating of the holy lands. And then, like the Prophet ﷺ, he gathered the people of Makkah and he said, what do you expect from me? 
And they said, you're Kareem, your father was Kareem, his father was Kareem. And the Prophet ﷺ said, اِذْهَبُوا أَنْتُمُ الطُّلَقَى لَا تَثْرِيبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْيَوْمِ He said, go, you are all free, there is no reckoning upon you. And the narration mentioned that the valleys of Makkah began to ring with the words, La ilaha illallah. And similarly, Ernal, the Christian chronicle of that time mentioned that when the Christians saw the compassion of Salahuddin, many of them embraced Islam. And Salahuddin, look at the justice of Salahuddin. He put 10 dinar on the men, 5 on the women, and 2 on the women, and 2 on the children. And those, when Salahuddin Rahmatullah saw a group of men carrying their elderly parents, he gave them money. And he gave them mounts. And then a group of women came to Salahuddin, and their husband had been captured in earlier battles. And they said, Oh Salahuddin, what life do we have without our husbands? And Salahuddin freed all of them. And then his brother asked for a thousand captives. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah gave him a thousand captives and he freed them. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah said, You will see my generosity. And he said, Whoever cannot pay the ransom, he goes to the back gate of Jerusalem. And the historian mentioned that so many people gathered that it was impossible to count them. And Salahuddin left them all go free. Every single one of them go free. Every and even on this occasion, Salahuddin didn't forget his teacher Nuruddin. Nuruddin Rahmatullah had a pulpit made for the day that Baytul, that Masjid Aqsa is liberated and the pulpit be placed in the Masjid. And Salahuddin didn't forget his teacher. He didn't forget those who did Ihsan upon him. And this was in Halab. And he had it brought from Halab and placed in the Masjid. And see, why was, why was the Holy Lands liberated? What was the reason? Because men and women gave a sacrifice. Average men and women, men like Isa al-Awam and Salma. Isa al-Awam, he was, he was a fisher. And his wife would often taunt him. She would say, why don't you join the army of Salahuddin? Liberate the lands. And he would say, you know, all my life, I wanted to know how, learn how to ride a horse and use a sword. But you know, I'm a fisherman. I've been caught up between my boat, my net, and the fish. And I've had no time. And the narration mentioned, one day Isa came home, and his wife Salma had gone. And she left him a letter, that I am going, because you are not man enough to join the army, I am going to join the army. And he felt ashamed. And the narration mentioned, he went and they put him into the navy, because he was a fisherman. And whenever somebody would fall overboard or something would fall overboard, he would jump and he would bring it out of the water, sacrificing himself until he was given the title Faris al Bahr, the knight of the sea. And Usamuddin wrote a letter to Salahuddin mentioning how brave Isa Lawam was. And when, after the liberation of Jerusalem, Salahuddin Rahmatullah met everybody. And when Isa Lawam came, they told him, this is Isa al-Awam, Faris al-Bah. Salahuddin stood up to meet him. And all of a sudden, they saw a woman running from the, from the crowd. And she came and she embraced Isa. And Salahuddin put his eyes down. And somebody came and said, Oh, Salahuddin, you know who this woman is? This is Salma. She's the most bravest of women. She would carry the Indian men from the battlefield and to the camps. Whenever we needed an issue, whenever a difficult time we needed to send a message, she was the first one to be ready. And Salahuddin mentioned, Salahuddin was sitting down, he stood up again. He stood up again. And he said, he said, indeed, you two brave couples, indeed, your meeting and your marriage is blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Europe had heard that their holy lands had been taken from them. Really, Europe went to blaze. Europe went to blaze. Pope Urban II died out of grief. And I say, Subhanallah Salahuddin, you know, you broke the backs of tyrants thousands of miles away. This is a miracle of Salahuddin. And then the subsequent Pope wrote a letter to all the kings that they should send every able person to fight. And the narrations mention that just from Germany, Frederick, the king, 
bought a million fighters. Alhamdulillah, he drowned on the way and the army dispersed. Richard, Philip, they bought 600,000 men. And Salahuddin was amazed, you know, at the zeal of Christendom. Really, he wrote letters to all the Muslim leaders. Nobody obliged. He would mention in the letters that there are more Christians at Acre than there are waves in the sea. He said, every time we kill one, they send another thousand. And 600,000 crusaders camp at Acre. And what they did is that they made trenches around them and then they barricaded themselves in. So Salahuddin Rahmatullah could have attacked them from behind. And for two years, Salahuddin remained in the field. He remained in the field. And Ibn Shaddad Rahmatullah says, he said, you know, Salahuddin, he would cry at the apathy of the Muslim leaders. And by Allah, we cry at the apathy of the Muslim leaders today. All those problems which existed in the time of Salahuddin, all exist today. The only thing different is that there is no Salahuddin to bring the Ummah together. That is the only different. And Ibn Shaddad mentions that at Acre, Salahuddin was like a mother who had lost its child. He says, if... The agony that's and pain that Salahuddin felt, if it was placed upon a mountain, the mountain would crumble. But see, this is why we remember Salahuddin. This is why we remember him. And this is why all the other leaders are forgotten. In the time of Salahuddin, how many kings were there? There were three khalifs in the time of Salahuddin. Does anybody know the name of any one of those khalifs? There was one in Egypt, one in Baghdad, one in Spain. Nobody knows because they didn't care. So history forgot them. But history remembers Salahuddin because he cared. When they lived in their palaces, where did Salahuddin live? He lived in a tent. He lived in a tent. When they slept on comfortable beds, Ibn Shaddad rahmatullah mentioned, he said, one night I saw Salahuddin, he, he couldn't sleep the whole night. He was in so much pain. The whole night he was tossing and turning. But morning came. At the crack of dawn, Salahuddin mounted his horse and he did not descend until sunset. When others had big meals in their palaces, Ibn Shaddad mentioned for times, for three days, Salahuddin ate nothing. He ate nothing because he felt this pain. When others lived with their families in their palaces, Salahuddin was on the battlefield. He was dodging arrows. When others lived with their families, Ibn Shaddad mentioned that one day the news came that Salahuddin's brother had passed away. Then his nephew had passed away. And he began to cry. And we didn't know why he was crying, but we began to cry with him. We began to cry with him. But... He says, then Salahuddin Rahmatullah went on the battlefield and it was as though nothing had happened. He was the same Salahuddin. And this is why history remembers Salahuddin. And it has forgot all the other supine, spineless tyrants. Like history will forget all these today, all these supine, spineless tyrants. And finally, after Acre went... Now, the, when the crusade... How, how much time do I have left? Okay. I'll cut it short here, inshallah. <clears throat> and I'll go on. Finally, the crusaders, after two years, they, the Muslims in Acre asked for terms. Richard gave them two terms. And then after that, he butchered every man, woman, and child in Acre. Every wo man, woman, and child in Acre. And we know Richard is a very interesting person. They try to draw comparisons between him and Salahuddin. By Allah, there was no comparison. I don't have time to go through it, but there was no comparison. He was a bit of a warrior, but besides that, he was a degenerate as a person. I mean, he couldn't even speak English. He was brought up in the south of France. He brought up in the south of France. He didn't like England. He couldn't speak a word of English. He was the king of England and he couldn't speak a word of England, English. 
If he had to go through the naturalization test, he would fail it. And he would say about England, he would say, you know, if I could buy, uh, if I could find a buyer for London, I would sell it. Because it's always wet and gloomy. You know, fortunate for you guys, he didn't come up to Blackburn, otherwise he would have given it away free. Because it's always wet up here. But recent historians tried to, you know, make comparisons between the two. And then they marched by the coast and they came to Jerusalem. And Salahuddin Rahmatullah took an oath, allegiance upon death from his men upon the rock. And then Salahuddin Rahmatullah you know, they mentioned that all night he wouldn't sleep. Ibn Shaddad mentioned that when Jerusalem was besieged, Salahuddin wouldn't sleep all night. We would beg him to sleep, he wouldn't sleep. Because his love for the holy lands was past any imagination. And Ibn Shaddad says, I met him at Fajr, he hadn't slept all night. And I said, oh Salahuddin, why don't you, it is a holy day, it's Friday. Why don't you give some sadaqah secretly? And then at Jummah, between the Adhan and the Kama, pray two rakats and ask Allah for assistance. And he mentions that day I was sitting next to Salahuddin Rahmatullah Alayh and he prayed the two rakats and then he began to cry and he was making dua. He was saying, he was saying, Ya Ilahi inni in qata'tu asbabi fi nusrat al dinik. He said, Oh Allah, all my own resources I have exhausted in assisting your deen. And the only thing I have left is that I turn to you. Only thing, wal itisamu bihablik, and I hold on to your rope. وَالْإِتِمَادْ عَلَى فضلك. And I ask you for your fadl and your grace. And Ibn Shaddad mentioned, I saw Salahuddin cry until his beard became drenched. And then the mat in front of him became wet. He cried and he cried. And then mentioned that the next morning the news came that the crusaders had lifted their siege. And Richard had said his famous statement, as long as a man like Salahuddin is protecting Jerusalem, you will never take it. And then it was Richard who asked for a truce. Salahuddin never asked for a truce. Salahuddin didn't want a truce. Ibn Shaddad mentioned he didn't want a truce. He would say that I fear that when I die, the Muslim armies would disperse and the Europeans will become strong. So the best that we can do is fight them until we cleanse our lands or die fighting. And Ibn Shaddad mentioned that Salahuddin had a greater goal. He had this greater goal. Ibn Shaddad mentioned that I was at Ascalan and this was the first time I had seen the sea. And the sea was pounding the waves. And I remembered the opinion of some scholars who say, the fuqaha, that anybody who goes to sea, his testimony shouldn't be taken because he can't be mentally sane. And he said, when I saw the nature of the sea, I understood the validity of this opinion. And whilst I was thinking, this Salahuddin came to me. And he said, Oh Ibn Shaddad, when we have cleansed the holy lands of the crusaders, what I wish is that I go over this land and I spread the word of Islam until not one crusader is, not one kafir is left on the face of this earth. And Ibn Shaddad said, he said, Oh Salahuddin, you are the pillar of this deen. You are the protector of this deen. What will happen if you die? And Salahuddin turned to him and he said, Oh Ibn Shaddad, what is the greatest of deaths? And he said, martyrdom. And Salahuddin said, that is what I desire for. Death in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The truce took place and Balian said in the awe of Salahuddin, he said, Oh Salahuddin, you have achieved something in Islam that nobody before you has achieved. He said 600,000 crusaders came and only one in 10 returned. Some died out of natural causes, some drowned, but he said the vast majority of Salahuddin you killed. And it was almost as though, and I'll finish here, it was almost as though Allah had kept Salahuddin alive just for that period. After the truce, Salahuddin went back to Damascus. And the narration mentioned that one wet day he went to visit the hajis. And when he came back, it was cold, it was wet. He became ill. And every day his state got worse. 
And Ali Maad mentioned, I was with Salahuddin when he was ill. He says, he says, by Allah, every time Salahuddin became more ill, it was as though his trust in the Rahm of Allah just increased. He said, the weaker his body got, the stronger his trust in Allah became. And even in that state, Salahuddin couldn't go to the masjid anymore. But he insisted on praying Salah with Jama'ah. And they would bring an Imam. They would help him up and he would pray Salah in Jama'ah. And Shaykh Jafar mentioned, I was reciting, on the ninth day, Salahuddin became unconscious. And Shaykh Jafar mentions that I was reciting the Quran by his bed. And when I re reached the verses, Wallahu la ilaha illahu, alimul ghaybi wa shahada. He, it is Allah and no Lord besides him, the knower of the unseen. He says, Salahuddin had been unconscious for a while. And I heard a faint voice saying, Sahih. He has spoken the truth. And he mentioned, for three days I recited the Quran by the bed of Salahuddin. And he said, on the final day when he passed away, I reached the verse, La ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkaltu. There is no God but Allah. And upon him I trust. And I saw Salahuddin's face become radiant. And he recited the shahada. And he left this dunya. And Ibn Shaddad mentioned that this was the greatest calamity to befall the Muslims since the demise of the Khulafai Rashidun. Ibn Shaddad mentions that many times I had heard the saying that I wish I could die on this place. And I always thought that this was an exaggeration. But he said, I realized the reality of that statement when Salahuddin passed away. He said, I wish I could have died on the place of Salahuddin. And Abdul Latif, the famous physician says that he was mourned like a prophet because everybody loved him. The good loved him, the bad loved him, the Muslims loved him, the non-Muslims loved him. Everybody loved Salahuddin. And what did this king leave behind him? King of Egypt, king of Syria, Lebanon, Yemen. What did he leave behind him? He left one dinar and 47 dirhams, some armor and a horse. This is all he left behind him. They had to borrow money for his janazah. But I'll tell you what he left behind him. He left a legacy behind him. He left a legacy behind him. And this is why we are gathered here today. He passed away at the time of Fajr. And after Zohar, they brought his body out. And the narrations mentioned that people screamed and cried as though the whole dunya had just become one place. And many people, when they saw his dead body, they couldn't believe it. They became unconscious. They didn't attend the janazah because they couldn't, they couldn't believe that Salahuddin had passed away, the liberator of the holy lands. And how was Salahuddin buried? They had to borrow money for a janazah. And Qadi Fadil gave a fatwa that Salahuddin should be buried with his sword. So that on the day of judgment when he's resurrected, and one of the seven people who is under the shade of Allah is Imamun Adilun, a just ruler. When he's under the shade of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is leaning upon his sword. So everybody sees that this is the liberator of the holy lands. And on his tomb they wrote, because this was the man who liberated. This was the man who flung open the gates of fortresses and ca castles of the Christians, one after the other. And on his tomb they wrote, O oh Allah, as his final victory, open for him the gates of Jannah. Open for him the gates of Jannah. And my dear respective brothers and sisters listening at home, Salahuddin is one of you know, the greatest heroes of Islam. And this is why we have gathered here to remember this. But the problem with many Muslims has become today, or with all Muslims, is that we live off our legacy. Nobody aspires to be a Salahuddin. Nobody tries to be an Umar ibn Khattab, or Abu Dhar, or Abu Bakr radiallahu anhum, or a Khadija, or a Fatima. Nobody aspires to be like them. We live off our legacy. You know, we remember these people. But none of us aspire to be like them. You know, as a poet says, he said, the Muslims come to the grave of Salahuddin 
and they come again and again. And what do they do? They stand by the grave of Salahuddin and they say, Qum ya Salahuddin, Qum. O oh, Salahuddin, stand. Stand up, O oh, Salahuddin, we need you. Can't you see what's happening in Iraq? Can't you see what's happening in Afghanistan? Can't you see the supine spineless leaders that we have? O oh, Salahuddin, we need you to liberate the holy lands. He says, the poet says, they come. And they say, قُمْ يَا صَلَاحَ دِينَ قُمْ حَتَّى إِشْتَكَ مَرْقَدُهُ مِنْ حَوْلِ الْعَفُونَ He says, they come to his grave and they say, O oh, Salahuddin, stand, stand. Until his grave began to complain about the stench around it. And the poet says, كَمْ مَرْعَةً فِي الْعَامِ تُوْقِذُونَهُ كَمْ مَرْعَةً عَلَى الْجِدَارِ الْجُبْنِ تَجْلِدُونَهُ أَيَطْلُبُ الْأَحْيَاءُ مِنْ أَمْوَاتِهِمْ مَعُونَ He said, how many times in the year are you going to wake Salahuddin up? He said, how many times are you going to whip Salahuddin for your own cowardice? And then he says sarcastically, أَيَطْلُبُ الْأَحْيَاءُ مِنْ أَمْوَاتِهِمْ مَعُونَ He said, has it come to this state? That the living have started asking their dead for help? The living have started asking their dead for help? And this is why, my dear respected brothers and sisters, you know, as I said, and as Ismail, you know, explained the situation, it is an obligation for us to assist these people. And it cannot be short term. It cannot be short lived. You know, as long as BBC has it on their Front page, we remember it. No, this must be sustained. Muslim, Muslims must be people who are, or, you know, who are ready to sacrifice. We can't be cowardice because we believe in the hereafter. You can't celebrate the life of Salahuddin and Umar ibn Khattab and then be cowardice yourself. We have everything by Allah. We have everything. Can you still feel? Can you still see? Can you still breathe? Because there are 1,300 Palestinians who are fulfilling a fard kafai on our behalf who cannot anymore. 400 Palestinian children, many of them incinerated by white phosphorus. Incinerated. And then we are worried. What will our counselors say? We are worried. Is this the kind of life that Muslims have started to live? You know, Abdullah ibn, Abdullah ibn Zubair once said, when he was challenging Hajjaj, he said, death in honor is better than life in disgrace. And there was a woman in the Spanish civil wars, she said, an amazing statement, she said, it is better to die on your feet than live crawling on your knees. And many of us have decided to live crawling on our feet. And we will give our excuses. It's hikmah. It's hikmah. Now I know there are certain places where it's hikmah, but this cannot translate into cowardice. You know, we will, we, we will entertain those same people. We will curse the Muslim leaders for entertaining Condoleezza Rice and giving her what is called jewelry. They have given her jewelry close to half a million, the Muslim leaders. But when it comes to the same people, the same local MPs, we will suck up to them. I mean, be people of substance. Be people of foresight. You know, as, as Ismail said, how can you drink Coca-Cola when you know it contributes to the death of your Muslim brothers and sisters? Don't you understand the words of the Prophet ﷺ when he said, al jasadin wahid? The believers are like one body. When their head hurts, the entire body feels a source of discomfort. But you know, we forget. As long as it's on the BBC, we remember. But when it's gone, we forget it. And this is why we're in the state that we're in. We are in the that is why we're in the state that we're in. And therefore, you know, we need a change of a change of view, a change of direction. If you and I say this, and Mufti Sahib is to come after me, and I apologize, I've taken a long time and this insolence for Mufti Sahib for me to do this. But you know, I believe. If a person does not drink Coca-Cola because he believes that it is, it is it, that Coca-Cola contributes to the atrocities upon his Muslim brothers, he will be rewarded by Allah. He will be rewarded. I was in Leicester, I gave a talk in the university and the brothers took me out. And Alhamdulillah, mashallah, all brothers on Sunnah. And they put Coca-Cola in front of me. And 
I said, no, Jazakallah. And they said, oh, you're on Ismail Adam Patel's fatwa. Yeah? And these were like brothers who were from my own maslak. And I say this, and this is no offense. Please do not take your offense. It was in a context. I said, listen, brother, you know, if it was your cousins in Gujarat who had been under occupation for 60 years, I could swear you would not drink this Coca-Cola. But the thing is, we give our personal and national legions a greater emphasis than we do on our Islamic identity. And therefore, my dear respected brothers, you know, we, we need a change of direction. I just want a final thing on the issue of boycotts. Because some brothers rang me from Birmingham today, and they, they decided to boycott Asda, first speak to Asda, and the reason they chose Asda, because Asda is in small heath. And small heath is like 95 Muslim, 95% Muslims, and everybody who shops in Asda are Muslims. They thought that this may be the best thing to do. So if you have any stores in your own areas, like Asda, Tesco, etc., go and speak to them, if you, you know the majority of people who are shopping there are Muslims, and tell them, look, we want all the products which come from...